Hey guys, welcome to week three. Um, hopefully everybody had a good Labor Day weekend. Hope everybody got to watch the Derby, did something safe, fun. You know, just got a chance to recharge your batteries a bit. Um, I can't talk about who actually won the Kentucky Derby because I'm actually recording this in the past. So the Kentucky Derby has not happened yet. You know, too bad. So this lecture is going to be on westward expansion. This is actually the start of our actual unit one. Uh, reconstruction is actually, we're not going to have any test questions on reconstruction. So once you finished your quiz last week, we're done with reconstruction. We're moving on uh, to westward expansion in the Gilded Age. So, you know, from this point, this is the start of a new unit, essentially. Um, what I want you to do is when you see this assignment, make sure that you click on this link to take you into Nearpod. Okay. Make sure you go there. There are quiz questions throughout the Nearpod presentation. So the, the audio for this lecture is not inside of the Nearpod presentation. So as you go through, if you need to stop the lecture and pause it, just come back to you know this window and pause me and then go back and answer your question um, in Nearpod. There's only there's only there's three sections of quiz questions. Uh, one of them has two questions. I mean, you've got four total questions to answer. Pretty easy stuff that you can move through, you know, probably relatively quickly. But, you know, this is this is good information. This is going to set up our entire week. So I wanted to take a moment just to kind of go through all the assignments. Or not really go through the assignments, but go through some of the content that you're going to be going through this week. Just so you kind of have a little bit of, of understanding or context about what exactly is going on. So. Um, of course, like I said, we're going over westward expansion in the Gilded Age and the expansion of America. Let me hide that. We don't need to see that, do we? So some of the essential questions that we're going to be studying throughout this unit, uh, what role does technology play in the development of societies? Why do people move? And is manifest destiny a form of imperialism? So let's just keep those in mind as we go through the unit. So a little bit of background context into, to what brings us into, you know, this part of history, um, westward movement. Really, the, the movement westward for Americans has happened since the outset of America, even going back before the United States became a country. Uh, even when we were still a colony of the British, people have been moving west from the original 13 colonies. Um, in fact, it was a part of the, the reason why Americans got so upset uh, with King George III was in 1763, he actually wrote a proclamation that stated that colonists shouldn't travel west of the Appalachian Mountains. And, you know, you had people like Daniel Boone who were, you know, going west and, and they enjoyed going west and they wanted to continue to go west. And so they didn't really like the, the king telling them what to do. Uh, but, he, but, you know, ever since that time, Americans have been moving west. Um, in 1803, Thomas Jefferson secured the Louisiana Purchase from France, paid um, $15 million for a huge amount of land. Um, I think I covered this in our basics to history, our basics of history uh, in the first week. Um, also, the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, uh, ended the Mexican-American War, but it also gave the United States, California, Nevada, Arizona, and New Mexico, also part of Colorado, and just really a, a huge swath of land. It also ended any Mexican claim to Texas. So, you know, Americans have been f filing west ever since we, we uh, won the Mexican-American War. Even more than that, gold was discovered in 1849, uh, you may have heard of the San Francisco 49ers. They're named 49ers after the people in 49 who traveled uh, from the east to the west along routes such as the Oregon Trail, which I would really like, wish that I had thought of to put a good graphic in here of dying of dysentery while trying to cross a river. I'm not sure if any of you all are Oregon Trail fans out there, but if you, you can play it online, I think. It's actually pretty fun. Um, so anyway. 
moving west something that people have always done and the, the big reason why people were moving west is is because it was there was economic opportunity for them out west out west they could you know get large portions of land they could farm they could you know they could cut timber they could um, you know, trap furs and make a living doing that. But really, it was just an opportunity for them to make money. As people on the East Coast, as the East Coast starts to become more urbanized and more populated, you know, people started to move west in, in search of better job opportunities and better opportunities to, to you know, for a better life, essentially. Um, and that's, that's, you know, that's, that kind of plays into our essential question, why do people move? A lot of times, a lot of people move for economic opportunity. And the same was true in the middle of the 1800s for Americans. So the term manifest destiny, if we look, this is probably one of the most famous paintings in regards to um, manifest destiny. You've got this, this angel figure traveling west carrying this uh, telegraph cable. Um, but there's a lot to it. I mean, you've got it kind of looks like if you look closely, it seems like the civilization over here to the right is pushing out the native Americans and the Buffalo and the wildness of the West is being settled as, as railroads move through as yeoman farmers here in the front uh, trappers here in the center. Um, you've got ranchers out here and, and, and then in the background, you've got, you know, civilization, you've got ships in the harbor, you've got buildings, bridges, etc. And manifest destiny is really, it was a term that was, was believed to be coined by John O'Sullivan. And we're going to read a little bit from John O'Sullivan probably today, um, that, um, that he, that they believe he coined in 1845. And it really just refers to this belief um, and many Americans believe that it was the irresistible destiny of America to extend its borders from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. Almost like, you know, again, it was a destiny that no matter what, they were going to conquer from the East Coast to the West Coast and everything in between. It was inevitable. You couldn't stop it. That's the way progress was going to go. Um, and they believed that it wasn't just inevitable, but that it was a righteous cause, almost like it was almost religious to these people that America extend its uh, democratic institutions, you know, from sea to shining sea and give all these people the opportunity to live in this land of freedom, um, which is ironic because at, at that time, one ninth of every person in the United States actually um, was owned by someone else um, and was not free. Um, and then, of course, you know, we're going to see here in just a minute the uh, effects that that civilization, that manifest destiny had on the Native American people who lived in the West already. I mean, you know, we talk the, some of the themes of manifest destiny is going to be populating the West, but it's already populated. But, you know, the U.S. government at that time didn't really like the people who populated it and they wanted it populated with more of their type of people. So that brings us to the Homestead Act of 1862. Put myself down here in the corner. So with the Eastern United States becoming more crowded and a growing population along the West Coast, because, you know, this time the gold rush has happened, people are moving to California. Um, the U.S. government wanted people to settle in the middle. They wanted people to settle in the plains um, in the prairies, um, even in Colorado, close to the mountains. They wanted people there. You know, for one thing, it made it easier to, to, for people to go from the, the east to the west if there were already people there. Um, and also it helped them kind of deal with their Native American problem by pushing Native Americans out of their lands into the reservations, which was always the goal for the U.S. government, you know, even before this time, they'd already relocated several thousands of Native Americans. And you think about the Cherokee people and the Trail of Tears, but they, but they were not the only ones. Um, you know, the Creek, Seminole, Choctaw, um, Shawnee, Iroquois, all these Native American tribes had already been relocated to the West, but they were going to continue to relocate them um, even further. Um, but the Homestead Act passed in 1862 gave farmers up to 160 acres of land all you had to do was pay a small fee and uh, file a petition 
to the U.S. government that you wanted uh, some land in the West. Uh, if they approved your petition, then you were given 160 acres. But the, the caveat was is that you had five years to improve the land. So basically what that meant was you needed to build a house. You needed to start farming. That was the only stipulation. That Within five years, you had to have a place to live there, and you had to be in the process of starting to farm in some way. You had to improve the land. That's a big that's a big thing that, that kind of goes into, you know, Western civilization thoughts on how to use land. And that goes all the way back, you know, even before settlers arrived in the United States. And it's part of the reason why, um, you know, American settlers and Native Americans never could get along. They never could understand um, how each other saw the use of the land. But I digress. That's a That's a conversation for you and your college professors whenever you get older. Um, unfortunately, much of this land, again, was already controlled by Native Americans, and this movement helped spark a lot of conflict. Um, this was actually on, on the heels of a relatively peaceful period between Native Americans and white settlers because the Americans haven't really been moving west a lot. They've been traveling through the west. But they've been settling in California, where you, know, you may not believe this or not, but California had already been settled by Europeans. Um, back in the in the 1500s and 1600s by Spanish settlers. So, um, you know, a lot of Native Americans had already been kicked out of California. Um, and there were already cities and towns that could be settled in for, you know, uh, white Americans. So the movement west and the settlement west started to spark conflict between Native Americans and the settlers. Uh, farming on the plains is extremely difficult. Um, I, I've got an assignment. I don't know if we'll get to it, but it, it looks at just the living conditions for people who lived on the plains, and they were really they were really tough. Um, a lot of times, farming was very isolated on the plains because this is really before railroads were built, even before main roads were built. So, a lot of these people were on their own, completely on their own. There was also little timber on the plains. I don't know if any of you have ever been to the plains, but it's mostly just pasture land, and the wind blows really hard, and you know there's just not any trees. So there's not any lumber to build houses or fences or anything out of. So for the most part, you had to build your houses out of sod, um, sometimes often referred to as dugouts. Um, and so the government seen right away as they started to move people to the west that they were going to need to build some kind of infrastructure that kind of connected all of these areas so that farmers could be successful. Otherwise, they were just going to leave because they didn't have any support from the government and there was a lot of danger in living completely out on your own. So the U.S. government intervened. Now you've got a question here. I'll give you a second to look at it. You've got a question here. It's actually a poll question, even though it's actually a multiple choice question. There is a right answer. Um, and take a moment to answer that question on your Nearpod. I'll give you a second. Just, just hold on. I'll, I'll take a drink and give you a second to answer your question. Okay, moving on. Uh, the Transcontinental Railroad. Um, this railroad, Transcontinental, means across. Trans means across, so across the continent. Um, Transcontinental Railroad, the Abraham Lincoln signed the Pacific Railroad Act of 1862. It's kind of amazing that Abraham Lincoln, you know, we think about him in the context of the Civil War, but he also signed the Homestead Act, which encouraged settlement of the West, uh, which was a big deal, gave people money and, and land to move West. And now we see the Transcontinental Railroad, which connects the eastern and western halves of the United States, both sign, being signed in 1862. You know, if the Civil War hadn't been going on, these would have been major acts of legislation. Um, but the railroad, the Pacific Railroad Act authorized two companies to start building the railroad that would connect the eastern and western halves of the United States. Uh, those two companies were the Union Pacific and the Central Pacific. This picture is actually taken, is actually an actual picture taken at what was known as Promontory Point, where the Union Pacific and Central Pacific Railway, railway lines met. Um, we'll get to that in a second. Um, the Transcontinental, uh, each railroad company was granted 200 foot right of way corridors to build the railroad tracks. So um, basically, the U.S. government declared eminent domain, which means that the government can just 
take your land essentially and they declared him in a domain completely in a 200 foot wide corridor straight across well it wasn't really straight but basically across um, the United States in order to build this railway um, each company was paid at, at a minimum sixteen thousand dollars per mile of track and up to forty eight thousand dollars per mile through the mountains so this was a huge government infrastructure project the government this was actually a really revolutionary thing for the government to do also to use tax dollars to fund a project like this and they actually uh, raised money through different different forms and, and fashions but I mean, it is it, just not we're not used to seeing that at this point in history. The government actually taking action in a stimulus program to build infrastructure through, you know, in any in any sense. Um, but it actually happens a lot these days. And, and the Transcontinental Railroad is basically the beginning of all those projects. You'll hear this presidential election cycle. You'll hear people talk about stimulus programs and uh, building infrastructure like this. This is the this is the brainchild that sparks all of that. Um, both sides employed immigrant labor groups, but the Central Pacific is especially employed thousands of Chinese immigrants um, to help build, especially the the very dangerous work of building tunnels and bridges through the mountains. The Sierra Nevada Mountains are especially treacherous. Obviously, we know about the Rocky Mountains as well, um, and it made life very difficult. And um, you know, a lot of a lot of people wouldn't do it for the wages that they were being paid, but there were there was a lot of Chinese immigrants that were moving to America at this point in our history um, because of some problems that were happening in China. Um, you may remember from your world history class talking about the Opium Wars um, and the Boxer Rebellion, which actually happens later. But there, but it's actually a bad time in Chinese history, and a lot of peasants are completely dirt poor. They hear about the gold rush in 1849, and so a lot of them start to come over to try to make uh, some money that they can send back to their families in China. Um, ultimately, most of them are not going to find a lot of gold, but they do uh, find jobs, especially working on places like the railroad. Um, finally, at Promontory Summit, uh, the two railroads finally met um, on May 10th, 1869. Um, and that was the completion of the uh, Transcontinental Railroad. Um, this picture here is actually a picture of what you would call a boom town. I believe this is actually San Francisco. You can see the streetcars um, and the, the carriages in the front. Um, but more connections would eventually be built into the Transcontinental Railroad, which built that infrastructure that linked basically the entire United States together. And um, all of a sudden, almost overnight, goods that used to take months to be shipped from one coast to the other can now be moved in a matter of days. Um, before this was built, it took about two to three months to ship something from San Francisco to New York. Because what you would have to do is you'd have to put it on a ship. That ship would have to travel all the way around South America and back up around the Gulf of Mexico, around the east coast of, of the United States to New York. Um, and if you think about it, that's a very dangerous track, especially for even though we have steam-powered ships at this point, um, most of them are still made out of wood. You don't really have your steel ocean liners yet, which you will eventually, but you don't have those right now. And they're especially susceptible to storms and things of that nature. So it's very expensive on top of being you know, very time consuming. Now, all of a sudden, you can put something on a railroad in, in San Francisco and have it to New York in about eight days, um, which is, it actually just completely revolutionizes you know, the way that we do business or the way that business happened in, in the northeastern United States. And it, it fueled uh, you know big booms in industrialization which we'll talk to you we'll talk about later on this unit about the problems that that created because um, anytime you have anything a major change it's not always going to be smooth I mean, even though it's a good thing in a sense there's always issues that comes along with things like that um, and you also had boom towns that started to pop up throughout the west around these important railroad junctures so whenever you have like a, a railroad hub where rail where railways are stopping and people are getting off and getting on um, you know, people started to build towns around those places, um, and they started to settle in those places. And then you see really basically the building of America around this railroad, uh, infrastructure. So you got another quiz here about railroads, the impact of railroads. So, or the impact of settling in the, in the West. Go ahead and answer that. I'll give you another second. 
This is a good time to pause me or just skip ahead for a second if you want to. Wish I, I should have got some Jeopardy music to play like right during this time while you're answering your questions. Anyway, moving on. So this rapid expansion to the West causes problems with the people who are already living in the West, as you might guess would happen. So um, this led to a lot of conflict. Um, a lot of natives were being pushed onto civilization or reservations. Um, but the, the caveat here was that a lot of these reservations, like especially the Sioux and the Lakotas, um, who lived on the plains, they were, according to the treaties that they signed with the U.S. government, they were allowed to travel off their reservations as long, it was, and it was, stip, it was stipulated this way, the wording was this way, that as long as the amount of buffalo um, that were still existed warranted the hunt. Okay, these were pastoral nomadic people. They moved around from place to place. They followed herds of buffalo around because every, all of their lives revolved around, you know, killing buffalo and using every part of the buffalo, you know, in their lives. So being forced into one section meant that, you know, they may take them outside of migration patterns of buffalo. So they, they would have it in their in their treaty that they could leave the reservation as long as they were as long as there was enough buffalo to warrant the hunt. Um, and I'm going to do another lecture on um, on the massacre at Wounded Knee separately. I, I'm going to cover it today, but I'm also going to do one separate, and we're going to talk more in depth about this specifically for those of you who may be interested. Um, but so what the U.S. government started to do in order to keep the natives on these reservations was they started systematically butchering buffalo. Um, I'm talking thousands and thousands of buffalo they they killed you know people talk about you know basically all, the near extinction of buffalo that was caused by the u.s government that was not caused by over over hunting by natives or over hunting um, by settlers although you know you could maybe argue that but really what the government was doing was they were paying trappers for the skulls of buffalo and that's a true that's a true statement they were paying they were paying uh, trappers for the skulls of buffalo. So every other part of the buffalo could be wasted. There are pictures. You can go find them in the 1870s and 1880s where there are just piles, huge piles of buffalo skeleton heads um, just standing up around outside of these railroad stations because they were just butchering these buffalo and just leaving them to rot. Because if they could force this extinction almost of this buffalo, then the Native Americans would have no reason to travel outside of their reservations. Exceptionally cruel, um, but it's something that was happening. Um, and, and these things happening led to armed conflict, um, especially the, the, war, the Great Sioux War, which led to the Battle of Little Bighorn, which you may remember as Custer's Last Stand, um, where Custer was defeated. And although the 7th Cavalry was defeated that day, ultimately... Um, the Sioux would eventually be defeated. Um, all, all in all, the, the amount of people or soldiers that the Americans could continue to throw into the war was too much for the Sioux, and they were forced back onto their, their reservations. So while they're being forced onto the reservations, in 1887, something called the Dawes Act gets implemented. And this, you know, although you may think that, that forcing people onto a reservation and not allowing them to leave... Um, by way of, of actually butchering an entire population of migratory animals would be cruel. Well, we're not done with the cruelty. Um, the U.S. government didn't stop with forcing Native Americans onto the reservations. Now, the Native Americans, especially in the Black Hills of South Dakota and North Dakota, um, they owned pretty large amounts of land or lived on pretty large amounts of land, but they didn't they didn't believe in using the land the way that the American government thought that civilized people should. Remember, in the Homestead Act, they forced people to improve the land if they moved onto it. Well, Native Americans weren't farmers. They didn't improve the land. They actually believed in something that's called use it for land rights, and they believed that everybody just owned land in common. Everybody could use the land together, and they own they own way more land than 160 acres per family. So what the U.S. government did in 1887 was they 
divided native reservation territory up so the individual members got a certain amount of land. Like if you were above 18, you got um, 160 acres, the, their family, their, their sons would get 80 acres and then down to 40 acres for people who weren't 18 yet. Um, and this led to a drastic reduction in native territory because, again, they own more land than, than you could branch out to, um, you know, break up by 160 acre lots. So what the government did then was they started selling off Native American lands um, outside of that 160 acres. So all of a sudden, Native reservations went from being, you know, very pretty large tracts of land to being smaller and smaller and smaller. I and mean, it also forced natives to give up their cultural practices. They they try they basically held the land in a trust for 25 years. The government did. They held the land in a trust, and they didn't give it to the Native Americans unless they abided by certain laws. They had to farm it. You know, they weren't farmers. But they had to farm it. Um, they actually basically helped force Native Americans to send their kids. They pressured them to send their kids to boarding houses, and we'll cut. We'll st- we'll talk about the the Carlisle School for Indians and. Um, some of the other schools that existed that basically tried to civilize these natives and forget about their cultural practices, cut their hair, forget about any kind of rituals that they uh, were part of and become Americans. Um, and you'll see, you know, basically assimilate or integrate into American culture. And you'll see that it actually, you know, it actually turns out to be, you know, fairly heinous in some ways. Um, you know, it's it's kind of like somebody forced you out of your home and told you that you couldn't live the way that you had always lived and your ancestors had always lived, and all of a sudden you have to live this way. And if you don't, then there are repercussions for that. So the Dawes Act. Um, in, in all of these things in combination. Okay, so you've got the Dawes Act that's forcing... You know, that's, that's basically cutting into reservation lands. You've got the um, Native Americans, are they're not able to continue hunt, hunting buffalo because the buffalo are becoming extremely scarce because the American government is systematically killing off every buffalo they could find. Um, then you have, you know, conflicts that you're not able to overcome. And basically the Native Americans get into the situation where they just feel really hopeless. There's nothing they can do to deal with the situation that they're in. And, and so, but there has to be a reaction. And this is, you know, if you look through history, there are several moments like this, you know, the, the Chinese Boxer Rebellion, um, the Boer Wars in Africa, where you have a people who are so oppressed that they don't really know how to handle that situation. And so they usually, ret- they usually kind of turn to methods that may seem extraordinary in some in some cases not like not extraordinary as in like wow this is awesome and it's going to work more like we may look at it today and think that it's kind of silly um but you have to understand these people are pressed to the the extent of of what they're capable of and they don't have any way to deal with it so um in the wake of all this a northern paiute native american leader named wavoka has a um, he has a dream one night about this dance, um, that if you do this, if he does this dance, all of a sudden the, the return of all these fallen um, soldiers, are, you know, they, their souls are awakened. Um, and with their help, the natives are able to push the white settlers out, um, and it brings back, you know, the herds of buffalo that have been gone. And he starts to kind of prophesy this message around. Um, it becomes known as the ghost dance. Um, And basically, you know, they think this is their way out, that if they do the ghost dance successfully, then they will be able to push out the white settlers, um, push out the American settlers and return to their way of life. That's all they really want is just to return to their way of life. They don't really they don't even really want to kill these white settlers. They just their whole goal is just to push them out of the territory that is theirs or that they believe is theirs or that even the first you know, treaties that were signed with the American government were there's actually, there's actually a landmark case just recently um, that the Supreme court decided that in Oklahoma um, the U S government had to honor its treaties that had been signed, you know, back in the 1800s over land disputes. And basically it divided, it's redivided Oklahoma um, back up into, um, you know, basically reestablish these Native American reservations. 
And, you know, that's really the whole point for a lot of these Native Americans is that they have signed these treaties in good faith with the American government. And the American government continues to break those treaties and try to sign new treaties that are that are less advantageous to the Native Americans than the previous ones were. And, you know, so so sometimes when we think about history, we think, that, oh, this is a long time ago, 1890s, whatever. Um, but this is still today. I mean, this is still happening. Um, even now, there's still disputes over this land. There's still disputes over the pipeline, the Keystone Pipeline. Um, that's going through this the same uh, Amer- the same Native American uh, Lakota Sioux uh, land. So anyway, so back to the point. I'm trying not to get too too off track here. I could probably rant for days about all this. Um, so the group of Lakota Sioux, uh, or a group of Lakota Sioux, starts practicing the ghost dance. They 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 meet with Wavoka. Um, they think that he might be right, you know, so they start practicing the ghost dance and this really alarms white settlers in the area because they think that this is basically like the beginnings of a, of a huge native American war, um, to try to basically drive them out. So they become worried. They, they reach out to the U S government. So, um, the local military comes in and they want to arrest sitting bull, who is the leader of the Lakota Sioux tribe. Um, they go in, about 40 uh, policemen, or really more like soldiers, um, go in to try to arrest him. Um, they're trying to take him out. Um, the, the Lakota Sioux don't want him, this to happen. You know, Obviously, this is their leader. They kind of push back a little bit. Um, a member of the Lakota Sioux shoots one of the soldiers who then shoots Sitting Bull, um, and then another person shoots Sitting Bull. Like first, first he gets shot in the, the chest. Then they shoot him in the head, and he dies. Um, and this sparks a lot of outrage. You know, as you might imagine, if you're a leader, if you're in, if you're in one of these tribes, and your leader gets killed, then you might be pretty upset. Um, so a lot of these Sioux decide to leave their current reservation, and they want to take um, shelter at a at a uh, another reservation that's just a few uh, miles away with other Lakota Sioux. Um, the word gets out that they're traveling and the U S government or the U S military, the seventh cavalry, the infamous seventh cavalry, um, stops them on the banks of the wounded knee Creek and they force them into this camp. Um, and the goal for, um, the seventh cavalry is supposed to be that they're going to confiscate all the weapons that the native Americans have. Um, they actually, you know, they, they do have guns at this point. They're not very many. They're not really any threat. Um, but they want to confiscate them, just make them, make themselves feel better. Basically that, you know, if they're going to do the ghost dance, they can do the ghost dance, whatever. But as long as they don't have any guns, then it's fine. Um, so the next morning they go, they go into the camp and they start trying to confiscate the weapons. They start trying to stack them up and, there is a, the, the story goes that there is a, a member of the Lakota Sioux who is deaf and they're not able to communicate with him. He doesn't understand what's happening. Well, they try to grab his gun, his gun uh, fires into the air. Um, this sparks the, 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 keep in mind that the camp is completely surrounded on all sides. And there are these, these guns called Hotchkiss guns, which are basically like, um, not really modern, but you know, advanced um, artillery um, as well as machine guns that are surrounding this area. And when that gun goes off, everyone on the hillside starts to fire um, down on onto the camp. Um, and they start to, to kill all the Native Americans that are inside of the camp. Uh, although a few do survive, most of them do not. Um, over 200 men, women, and children will be murdered uh, at Wounded Knee. Uh, the massacre occurred on December 29th, 1890. Um, 90 Sioux men and over 200 women and children would be killed. Uh, 30 U.S. soldiers do are killed in the resulting action, but pretty much all of them died from friendly fire. Um, for their actions, uh, over 20 medals of honor would be given to members of the 7th Cavalry for their actions. And just think about that. Just think about that, the fact that this was a massacre that that people who did not have weapons were murdered by the U S by the U S military and over 20 members of the seventh cavalry who had performed the actions were given medals of honor. 
Um, to put that into a little bit of context, during World War II, uh, over 64,000 Native Americans would fight for the United States uh, military during World War II, and only three would be given medals of honor at any point for actions um, contributed during World War II. Um, now, you could say that before, uh, the, I read somewhere that before 1919, Medals of Honor were given out, you know, a lot easier than they are now, but still, just think about that for a second. And also, in, in at Wounded Knee, there was a memorial put up for the U.S. soldiers who died, um, and all the, uh, all the natives were actually thrown into a mass grave, and there was no remembrance paid to them for years. It wasn't actually until not the 1990s that a memorial was finally built um, by the U.S. government for the Native Americans that had been massacred there. So um, that pretty much sums up in Native American relations in the late 18, uh, 1800s. Um, they were always viewed as a hindrance to white progress by their own very existence, and their lives were not considered equal to those of whites. Um, and they were just not treated fairly at all. So um, you've got another quiz, a couple of questions to answer about um, Native American um, relations with uh, the United States government. Go ahead and answer those. Um, hopefully the next time we talk, it'll be on a little more uplifting note, um, which we'll be talking about the, the Gilded Age and, um, inventions and progress, um, and we'll also be talking about immigration, so uh, maybe we won't be so uplifting. <laughs> I don't know. Um, it takes a little while to get up, to get too uplifting. The late 1800s are a rough time um, for minorities, immigrants, Native Americans um, in American history. So um, go ahead and answer those questions. Hope everybody's having a great week. Um, I will talk to you guys later on this week. If you need anything from me, make sure you reach out. Just send me an email directly, uh, bradley.woodcock at wayne.kyschools.us, or you can call the school. Uh, we can set up a time. If you need to come in person and do some work up here at school, you know, feel free to just let me know, and we can we can make that happen. I can't have a lot of you up here at once, but um, if some of you want to come up, just let me know in advance, and we'll, we'll schedule some time, okay? All right. I hope everybody has a great week.